Hello and welcome to Doctor Who 50 Years Ago, the show that looks back to the episode that aired in 1970 and looks at the differences between then and now. This week, Malcolm Hulk's The Silurians, episode four. And truth be told, it's all in the mind, you know. I am Ben. I am Luke. And I'm Nick. And here we are, and here we go into the news from 1970. On Thursday the 19th of February, 11 children and five women were killed by US Marines in the village of Son Fang in South Vietnam. Four of the members of the Marines would be court-martialed and two convicted in separate trials. Life sentences slash five-year prison terms would be commuted to one year's hard labour and one year in prison, respectively. So, um, remember Vietnam? <laughs> yeah, it's still hell in Southeast Asia. And again, we have army people on edge sent to a war, which was at least strategically silly, and happily going gung-ho because they don't wish to be there. And again, it's all in the mind because God knows what they're inflicting, one on the villagers and two on themselves. It's uh, pretty nasty out there, and it will continue to be so for at least the next five years. <laughs> but that's Vietnam for you. War is hell. It is definitely just that. Also on that day, Congress voted to prohibit federally required desegregation busing, which is the practice of busing African-American students to white schools rather than the closest school by geography. Um, I had to take a look at this one really hard because, yes, it's a backward step in equalising schools and education so they accept children as children, and not based on racial origin. Thankfully, though, it's eventually reversed in a Supreme Court ruling in 1971. But as we see here, uh, work to achieve progress is slow and sometimes goes backwards. So, so if I'm reading this right, this is that even though there's a school closer to a black child, uh, they will go to... A white one to make it racially equal. Right, yeah. And then, well, OK, well, that makes sense, because also... Historically speaking, the black schools would have been given much less funding. So mm. this is actually by sending the black children to the white schools, th th they're getting much a, a much better opportunity there than they would in the black school. So even if there's one closer, the, yeah, the, the, that, that, this is a backward step, as you said, but it gets overturned. So yeah, and and it, and it ends a 15-year battle that started with Brown versus Board yes. of Education. Well, this is classic American sort of how their progressivism uh, goes forward throughout their entire history uh, is for every few steps they take forward, they take one or two backward sort of thing. Hmm. So there's always a, a f they go forwards, they do some groundbreaking new social thing. And then there's a massive sudden reaction against that. Uh, the, so after the Civil War, uh, slaves are freed and black people are given the same rights as uh, white people. That's a big deal. And then the next few decades after that, us southern states, they are repealing those rights effectively. It's the Jim Crow laws that disenfranchise the, the black people in their states. Mm. Um, you can even uh, look further back to America's origin in that you have the Federalists and then the ones that want separate states. Yes, yeah. Which leads towards your conflicts. Yes, and, and, and so then to take those two historical examples and give a modern example, <clears throat> you've got Obama, the first African-American president to be ever elected. Um, and you have him for two terms. And then who do you get immediately after? This massive progressive change for America, this massive forward, honestly, like an African-American became president of the United States. That's a big deal considering only 100 or so years earlier slaves were a thing you know and then you get you get donald trump the reaction so there, there is always big forwards push in social things in social values and then you have this big push against that and that that's a recurring theme in american history 
Newton would be proud, wouldn't he? Yes. And also in the news this week, war over Radio Free. 134 people at Radio Free, alias the third programme, write into the Times to say that the BBC, the makers of those four radio programmes and all the rest, and, you know, it being the British Broadcasting Corporation, isn't going to be doing enough creative and interesting programming going forward into the 1970s. This is 134 people working on a radio station expressing their opinions, which their contracts forbid because the BBC is a public service broadcaster and so they need to be sort of impartial. The fallout will be huge. Over to our media correspondent. OK, so Radio 3 at this time, you had, as the title would suggest, three big parts to this. You had the music programme, which was classical music during the daytime. You had the sports coverage, which was uh, sports coverage. And also you had your adult educational programming, which also said... But you also had the third programming, which was your arts, it was your music and your poetry, your plays, that sort of thing. Remember so, culture? So, so, so this is the radio equivalent of BBC Four 50 years ago. Yes, that's exactly what it was, right? So there was this thing in 1969 where the BBC took a hard look at itself and created this thing called Broadcasting in the 70s. And just thinking that sets off an alarm nowadays among radio nerds. Because it basically said that a lot of Radio 3 would be taken and stuck onto Radio 4. Nobody wants that, especially these 134 people writing in the Times. And we'll talk about how this eventually ends when it does end in April time. Um, Okay. (laughs) Later in the week, the BBC governor comes out from hiding, well, the director general, and he says, you lot are bloody liars. So nobody really enjoys the fact that uh, that they're finally starting to have a bit of say about what they're doing. Yes, and that that does equate to union representation. Oh, funny you say that about union representation, Ben, because isn't it interesting that, oh, 50 years ago we've got unions that command power and support and have quite a bit of media influence, and it's quite a different story now isn't it where the unions are almost viewed as well they're viewed as a a bad thing really i'd say primarily they're not viewed as a a force for good in regards to uh they're they're viewed with suspicion aren't they they're the enemy there was a poll by a local news service about the rmt strikes that brought down uh the london southwestern railway train network in december oh, and well d- december 2019 december Correct. 2019 yes and it was something like 85 percent of people did not agree with the rmt strikers yeah no, that, that sounds about right I, nowadays i i would say that i don't encounter any sort of feeling that people do agree with strikers of any kind really i feel like the reason someone was striking would have to be so literally Dickensian in their employment rights that they were offering or that sort of thing. Mm. And indeed, that's what we're looking for. Tiny fragments of social change between 50 years ago and now in the news from 1970. That was the news. And now we shall get into the Silurians. Episode 4, 21st of February 1970. We reveal the Silurians a bit at a time. They're aliens, they're over here, and they're angry. Some of them more than others. There are also humans. They're also here, and they're angry. Some of them anyway. Why is that? And why is that is a question that Hulk details and answers with each character's reaction based on the scenario that they are presented with. And it can be boiled down into a slightly simplistic good versus evil scenario in that most want to destroy but the few that don't are our goodies 
Um, I will attempt to talk about each mentality and how it links to the world 50 years ago, and perhaps, as we did in the news, draw comparisons to current events as well. And that's why it's all in mind, you know. Well, one of the very last notes I have here reads, No good people slash very small smattering of good actions. Divide there. Yeah, pretty much everyone seems to be violent or single-minded. Is this what it was like being Malcolm Hulk, just looking at everyone and thinking that they, they're they basically a fascist? Everyone's a fascist compared to Malcolm Hulk. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very much a mentality of him versus the world in, in some of his stories, at least. Mm. Most notably Invasion of the Dinosaurs when it comes to ecology and the Radio Times for promoting <gasps> dinosaurs, which is why he never wrote for the programme again. Yes, that's incredibly sad. Yeah. For me, this is this is probably the episode where stuff starts to happen. We, we, we finally have got to the point where the Silurians aren't just this concept that exists and they're somewhat separate from the events of the Doctor and the humans. <clears throat> it's finally starting to actually come together. We've established our claustrophobic atmosphere now we can finally move on to actually things happening um as you say um the silurians are revealed at a bit of a time and the story is revealed at a bit of a time so why not reveal this episode in greater detail the doctor comes face to face with a silurian and talks to it immediately we are hit with either hulk or let's vision aliens are intelligent too but the Silurian is spooked away, though. Major Baker has a map of the caves and is evidently planning to escape and go back and find his saboteurs, which he does so and probably gets captured by the Silurians. The brig's going to search the caves militarily, whereas the Doctor wants a scientific way. It's an on-pass which goes, out, goes on throughout the whole episode. And because the brig is militaristic... The Doctor does not talk about the Silurians to him. He instead takes Liz with him towards the Silurian base. It's it's the military versus the scientific mind. This is where we're going in this episode. And it, it fleshes itself out to characters, to secondary characters. Can I just say, um, is this not one of the best cliffhanger resolutions in Doctor Who history? The Doctor holds out his hand and says hello yeah yes it's it's a complete sea change from what we've had in the past seven years oh no an alien run away the line i really like in that scene is the humans will destroy you yes Um, i wrote this down you carry on oh well then uh feel free to chip in if i'm going the same way as you okay so the humans that's kind of referring to all of them but Really, it's just the military that's going to destroy them, and the politicians. And that's kind of shown that those are the ones with the power here. It's not the good people who are strong. It's the ones who want to get their way, who are going to get their way. Well, I might also argue... um, So, obviously it's a foreshadowing thing here. The humans will destroy you. But also... um, when you view an outside group as the enemy, well, they all become the enemy. You, you know what I mean? Like People don't start to think, oh, well, there are... If you're that sort of scared of outsiders, you don't think, oh, the, some people of that outside group are fine. Some of them are good. No, you think they're all bad. And Hulk here shows that quite a few humans think of the Silurians that way, and quite a few of the Silurians think of humans that way. So... They're both basically as bad as each other. Mm, it's morally grey. Mm. Yeah, so there are some really good Silurians and some really good humans. And if only the good ones could get their way, then no one would have to die. But unfortunately, the bad ones... As you, and this does work with your point, Luke. The bad ones have power, not the good ones. Another thing I had about uh, this scene, or this uh, part of the episode, is um, I was... A question I posed here was to, I guess, to anyone. What do you reckon 
the script said about uh, Quinn's booby trap, as it were, you know, the bit where he gets put in the water and it fizzes or whatever. I was just thinking, what? You know, and then Liz and the doctor come along and they throw a stone in there and it fizzes. So it's, what do we reckon Malcolm Hulk actually wrote as the trap was? You know, what, what was the trap that he wrote? I suppose the human equivalent would be either a landmine or a bear trap because it just sort of holds him in place, allowing the Silurians to knock him out, basically. And obviously they thought, ooh, caves, we need some kind of interesting geographical thing. I know, let's make a pool of water which bubbles. I mean, is it meant to be Probably upset the set designers, no end. Well, is it meant to be so hot that he can't move, or is it... As well. I was just interested. I wonder what the script says to make them think that's. I, it, ah, I imagine what must have been put down would have been more expensive. Uh, no, let's not look at the target novelization. Ben, look at the target novelization. Ah, uh, cave monsters, cave monsters, there you are. Oh, yes, it's got the, uh, the pose of the campiest looking Silurian I've ever seen in my life. Um. We've gone a bit too far. A cartridge from an FN.303 rifle, said the Doctor. Did Hulk write? I'm assuming he wrote the, the novelization. Oh yeah, he wrote the novelization. Well, he's Major Barker in here for some reason. Uh, we, 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 we could put a guy in some water and uh, I, I could blow my <laughs> hair dryer under it, but we can't do anything more than that. What, what, you want these clamps? Oh my god. The Doctor and Liz don't find the, the pool of water, so that seems to be a visual aid. I'm trying to look for Major Baker's capture. Why are we looking over a blooming pool of water? Such a weird idea for a trap. I, I like how it seems so different from human technology. Like a human idea of a trap. I just mm -hmm. wonder what Hulk wrote in the script that made the designers come up with that. It's definitely in there, I'm just not looking at it properly. Christ, there's a lizard in my barn, etc, etc. Mad trap. There's a chapter called Man Trap. Oh wait, Doctor. Goodbye, Doctor Quinn. Oh, for God's that. sake, really? I'm not looking for bloody man trap? Oh, look! Man traps! <laughs> oh, I've made it at last. A metal trellis had sprung up from the soft sand, trapping both his ankles, which is far too violent for television. There we go. Man trap! Oh. Did, did, didn't I say steel jaws? You might have done, it's all down I to I said you. steel clamps. Well, well, well you're going to edit this together somehow. To make so, me look good, yes. Beforehand, the equivalent well, would be a bear to, trap or a man. Bonus to hold, like, us searching desperately for the, the answer in the Or you two de desperately searching for the target novelization. Okay, can we do this properly? Luckily, I have the target novelization to hand, and it talks of a metal trellis, which eats up Major Baker's foot, and then he gets captured by the Silurians. So I can only presume that was the original intent, but, you know, a metal bear trap eating his foot uh, is a bit too violent for television, so bubbly water pool it is. They, they seem to be more in touch with nature. Their, their base seems more natural than any human technology there is. So it, I like the fact that the water there so yeah, is it, the first sign of that, that they're more natural. It is a good alternative. And now let us pull our feet away from this water trap and move on. The Silurian base has a dinosaur and lots of Silurians in it in their clothy costume glory. And they're working on reviving their species. Um, which is why the research centre has power losses. Major Baker has been locked up and the Doctor talks to him. Despite the aliens, he still has a Cold War mentality because he's being asked questions by the Silurians, so that they can invade. And on top of all of this, the permanent undersecretary of the Ministry of Science has come to the research station. Naturally, he and Dr Lawrence, not neither for those of you keeping up at home, are chummy. The permanent undersecretary is intelligent, but he's single-mindedly looking for the solution. Lawrence wants scientists only, and Unit and the Doctor, out of his research station. The Undersecretary is sympathetic to Lawrence. So the mentality of Lawrence and the permanent Undersecretary Masters <laughs> um, is very interesting in that they're just single-mindedly wanting to get on with their job 
and be damned for non-existent looking saboteurs. Well, I mean, this continues the theme that you were talking about earlier about in this episode. Uh, whoever, whatever anyone's objective is, they are single-minded on that thing. So the Doctor is single-minded on peace. Then there are multiple Silurians and humans that are single-minded on war, but uh, vice versa. The, the, here we see, really, every character is thinking about one thing, and that's their driving motivation in this episode. Um, perhaps that's how Malcolm Hulk seeks. Perhaps that's how Malcolm Hulk sees people. You know, they have motivations that kind of overwhelm them and just make them go for one thing. Or it could be how he writes characters for this sort of time period, given his background writing soap operas. Ah, uh, yes. He's coming from a television tropes toolbox, pulling out the, the appropriate things putting him into a script, making it all nice. Baker continues to be interrogated by the Silurians, both young and old. So we establish that there is a social hierarchy or maybe a class or caste system in the Silurian race. The old leader has more peaceful scientific intentions, although we'll see more of that next episode, whilst the younger, the younger one is more brash, emotional and has militaristic tendencies. An argument ensues about the humans' next move. But just as the Doctor's winning people over with his scientific side, Dawson comes in and tells of Quinn's death, his relationship with the Silurians, and her kill-or-be-killed mentality shines through amongst the humans. Suitably provoked, the Brig's going to go in with the military. And here we are, military versus scientific, Rational versus irrational, kill or be killed, or, you know, live peaceably. It's a very Cold War mentality. An interesting thing here is that, um, so we've got the older Silurian and the younger one. And so there's that hierarchy there. Well, that sort of reflects modern Britain. And I suppose to some extent, Britain 50 years ago, where there's a big generational divide. And it's probably probably as big now as it was then and it receded somewhat in the middle of these 50 years but we've now gone back to a very polarized society a long age which hasn't mm. been for a while we we have the tired old war-torn old and the brash arrogant but still incredibly violent young so so violent that they'll overthrow the old no, that's 50 very. years ago and, and now we've got those people who overthrew the old regime, as it were, they're now, you know, the man. And you've got this new generation that's grown up with no concept of war or anything like that. And and I suppose you could say, like, probably have the best conditions that any generation has ever lived under, but then they know that their relative... Uh, standards will be lower than th their parents generation which is quite a galling thing to learn you'll be relatively speaking less well off than your parents uh the world's struggling a little bit with that at the moment isn't it and that'll just make them angrier on a lighter and nerdier note about young versus old during the bit in is it called the cyclotron? Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. even though, I mean, that's not how a nuclear reactor would work. But that is a thing, yes. Anyway, carry on. Yeah. During the bit in the cyclotron, they use the phrase 2,000 million rather than 2 billion. And Fowler's 1996 dictionary says since 1951, billion was being used more and more by the young'uns. And Malcolm Hulk was 46 when he wrote this. So that, I think, is a tell that this is written by an older gentleman. Although not, you know, you know he's not 80, but he's not 22. Yeah, so he had his... He, he, was, he was an adult by the war. So he still used British billions, which is a lot bigger than 
American billions, which has become the default, hasn't it? Mm. In 1975, Dennis Healy, the Chancellor, says they're going to be adopting the US billion. So that shows that by this point, although I believe it was still used in technical language around this point, thousand million, but it shows that it's on its last legs. Just a thought. It's not the most interesting thought I've ever had. No, 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 it, no it, it's, it's interesting. Well, it's good. It's it's how language it's, develops, isn't it? You know, it's, it's changed. That's my thing. How 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 yeah, language and phonetics and things like that transfer from one generation to another, and that's foretold in the writing of somebody who's also in that social clash between the old and the young. Talking about social clashes in this episode of Doctor Who 50 years ago. Good on ya. The yeah. Next bit. Last bit. The Doctor goes in ahead of the Brigadier and warns the Silurians of the attack. He is imprisoned for it. The Silurians negotiate from a position of strength, you see. The Doctor wants interspecies peace, and the Silurians claim privilege of they were on the Earth first. Major Baker is unamused. He doesn't want interspecies peace. Oh, well, at least I said it right first. Um, <clears throat> Major Baker is unamused. He doesn't want interspecies peace. The Silurians trap unit in the caves, and the young Silurian attacks the Doctor because the humans are attacking. And there we have an episode about mentalities, a clear, distinct division between the science and the military, the rational and the irrational, the reason and the emotion, the young and the old, as demonstrated in humans, in television and aliens 50 years ago, and most definitely in humans now. So it's interesting that this uh, episode, being 50 years ago, was pretty on the money about irrationality winning. And that seems pretty you know, uh, prescient, considering where we are nowadays. One doesn't have to make a rational argument to win said argument. Mm, any specific examples? Well, I mean, obviously the political situation of certain countries of Europe, North America, and Oceania sort of offer up interesting examples. Um, also, just with the with the internet now, you had a revival of fringe conspiracy theories that have gone from nobody believing them to a very, you know, very strongly held belief by a small section of people, but still, they're getting their view out, you know, like, what, there are now flat earth conferences that happen annually, or things like that, which is quite absurd, considering no one's believed in the flat earth since Greek times, ancient Greek times, I should say, but it's these sort of things I'm um, going on about. It doesn't have to be rational. Mm, or, right. Or, or people have convinced themselves of rationality despite being totally irrational. Mm. The grains of truth in the hourglass of reality are sort of wearing a bit thin. Yes. If you like. Perhaps we can learn from this episode of Doctor Who 50 years ago to make differences in the world nowadays. Thank you very much for listening. You can find us on Blogspot, which redirects to iTunes. Leave positive comments there, it helps. I'll say that again. <clears throat> Leave positive comments there, it helps. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube, where you can like, comment and subscribe, and Google Plus if that's still a thing. We shall be back next week with the Silurians episode 5, where the mind and the matter collide with consequences to be had. Until then, I have been Ben. I have been Luke. And I have been Nick. Thank you. And goodbye.